with the uh, drum beat coming up again now. Yes. Yeah. You know, just is something. We want to talk a little about your own background also, you know, because you you were an architect and you were ambassador in Washington. Yes. Sir. Yeah. So we'll talk a little of that. Welcome, welcome very much to Conversations, where it's a great pleasure to welcome to the program His Excellency Nazir uh, Hamdoun. He's the ambassador of Iraq at the United Nations. Now, as we talk, on uh, November 11, 1998, and... Uh, Iraq and uh, is very much in the news now and uh, so we're very pleased that you've been able to find time to be with us and we welcome you to the program uh, ambassador and uh, to to Manhattan Network. Thanks. We want this to be a chance for you to be able to share with us and for the cable television audience your perception of events that are there. We get a great deal in our media by our representative and so forth. We want this to be an opportunity to sort of in a sense get your perception of it and the, your colleagues perception of the of the geopolitical and reality that that you, the way you see it but i wonder we have some time i wonder maybe you could share a little of your own background you're currently ambassador at the un but uh i know you have an architectural uh, training and your architectural background and you were ambassador maybe you could share a little of your own background and then we could talk some about the historical development leading up to this time and then specifically uh you know aim, uh, have understanding of this uh, events as they're emerging now in November of 98. But could you share a little of your own background, please? Well, my background is uh, being, uh, as you mentioned, an architect by a profession. Mm -hmm. I uh, majored in architecture and town planning in Baghdad University. And obviously, I had to serve in the army for the, <coughs> was drafted for two years. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I served in the, uh, the Air Force as an architect in different air bases. Mm -hmm. Then I moved into the party bureaus. Uh, I joined the Ba'ath Party uh, when I was about 15 years old. Yes. Uh -huh. So uh, from the uh, college to the party bureaus and uh, spent uh, more than a decade in that sphere dealing with different Arab affairs and issues. Uh, then into the information uh, ministry and culture. Uh, I, I covered the cultural side of, uh, of the activities of that ministry. You're very sensitive to art and well, yeah, architecture probably, is a yes, art. Yes, yes, yes you know, the queen uh, of the arts, isn't it? a combination it? of art and science. Yes, uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, <coughs> I oversaw the, uh, during a couple of years the uh, archaeological uh, activities, also other arts like plastic art and music and these activities that are supported by the government uh, and uh, many resources were really spent generously on those spheres to try to advance uh, and to provide uh, better opportunities for Iraqi artists and archaeologists and so forth. Yeah, you have such a rich History. Well, I mean, you it, talk it, of Mesopotamia. It is incredible. Here. You yes, talk right. of Mesopotamia, yeah, yeah. Uh, thousands of years yes, of, of culture and the yeah. first writing in the history of mankind. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I was picked in 1983. Mm -hmm. Our relations were just starting to warm up with Washington. Mm -hmm. And I was picked by the president to uh, come to the United States and uh, to represent Iraq. And time when I came to Washington in late 83, we didn't have a full di diplomatic relations, so I was not appointed ambassador, but a charge yes. running a small intersection. Having gone into the Foreign <coughs> Service and having been in the cultural No, that industry? was my first uh, oh, yeah, okay. assignment in the Foreign Service. Yeah. I never served before uh -huh. in this whole sphere. And uh, Had you been in the United States? Well, well I've well? been a couple of times before yeah. that. Uh -huh. I came to uh, New York in 1970. Uh -huh. In July, I think, of 1970, to represent Iraqi uh, delegation of youth. Uh -huh. It was like the 25th anniversary uh -huh. of the United Nations. And th that was, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, a, a youth uh, co a world conference was, uh, was uh, taking place here, was held, and I was heading the Iraqi delegation uh -huh. uh, of youth. Yes. And I spent a couple of weeks here, and then a couple more visits during the 70s. Yeah. Uh, so by eight, by by late 83, I was in Washington, uh, uh, struggling to try to improve ties and relations. And within a year time, 
uh, we were able to establish full diplomatic relations. Right. And I became the first ambassador in 17 years uh, from Iraq to uh, Washington. Congratulations. It was a huge responsibility. It must have been a great well, challenge. Well, it was. It yeah. was a yeah. challenge, and yeah. I think it was a success. Uh -huh. Not attributed only to me, but also to the whole work of the Iraqi diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we established a very strong tie, I remember, with, uh, with the different uh, departments and agencies, and people in Washington were very pleased to see that Iraq is uh, coming as a factor in trying to uh, to reshape the American policy in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. At that time, we had the Iraq-Iran war, mm -hmm. and we were able to solicit many support from different uh, factions within the American system. Mm -hmm. to end the Iraq-Iran war and to try to put uh, pressure on Iran in order uh, for the war to stop. Uh, I uh, ended my tenure in, in 1987 and mm -hmm. went back to Baghdad as the undersecretary for uh, Ministry of Foreign Relations. Mm -hmm. And I oversaw our relations with the West, including the United States, uh, during five years till my coming to New York in 1992. You, you had a wide purview, isn't it? You had also South America and, and Asia, and a, and a good deal of uh, foreign relations was under I your used purview. I yeah, oversee most there. of those yeah. areas, including yeah. uh, the West Europe and the United States. Uh, and you had made a great number of uh, friends in Washington, and you were well known there, and you were that was something that served you well, actually. Well, I, I still yeah. cherish many of those yes, right. friendships, I know, uh, yeah. I mean, though it has become difficult. Yes, for imagine. for those friends to try to follow up and to uh, try to uh, keep up with me. It might be worth mentioning the role of Iraq and the view of Iraq in terms of at that time when Iran and Iraq were at loggerheads and so forth. But that Iraq was seen as a Iran was seen as a great by in the minds of many people as a great potential threat to interest. Well, and Iraq yeah. was a bulwark against that. And there were a great many allies that were seeing Iraq as being a person, uh, an entity that was standing against the threat of Iran. Is that, was that not true? And that it was possible to make many close uh, friendships uh, based upon that geopolitical perception of things then? Well, you remember, uh, at the peak of the uh, Iranian revolution and yeah. Khomeini, right. Iran was really considered a big threat, not sure. only to Iraq, but to the rest of the region. Yes. Uh, because of this notion of exporting their own Revolution. concepts and yeah. trying to indoctrinate the uh, different regimes in the area. Oh. And we know how weak some of those uh, sheikdoms in the, in the Gulf are. Mm -hmm. And I think that Iraq has done a great job in, 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 in uh, maintaining the uh, sec security and the political order mm -hmm. in that region. If it wasn't for Iraq paying all the blood, I mean, that They did pay a heavy price. Uh, I don't think that the region would have survived uh, uh, Khomeini uh, uh, you know, upheaval, uh, especially when it was at its peak. It's good for us to remember that, isn't it? I think it's yeah. very good for people yeah. to, to remember history. It's yeah. very difficult to try to reconstitute history the way, uh, you know, to, to, to somebody's liking, mm -hmm. as unfortunately some of the experts are doing in this country here now, trying to uh, lump some all the events in a way that is damaging to Iraq's image. Yeah. Iraq was the stabilizer for the whole Gulf the region, stabilizer uh, yes. for the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the events of the 80s at the end of it uh, did not help that role. The effort was to try to undermine Iraq's uh, power, which I think was a stabilizing power. And this is what has uh, led to the uh, different economic activities that was led by Kuwait uh, and, and a few others to try to uh, depress the prices of oil. Mm -hmm by overproducing, mm -hmm. and uh, which has led the revenues that Iraq used to collect uh, to decrease significantly, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and which has led us to really feel the pressure and to try to respond by different protests. And uh, I remember the Baghdad summit where Iraq said, Saddam, President Saddam Hussein said that uh, waging economic war amounts to waging uh, real war, I mean, because there is blood involved here in terms of the suffering of the Iraqi people. And he warned the Kuwaitis from uh, continuing uh, that. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the Kuwaitis mm -hmm. did not respond in any positive way. And we ended up with the events of the uh, 1990, yeah, August 1990. Right. Mm -hmm. 
And things went and, and spun in a way that did not really serve both the stability of the region and the tranquility of the Iraqi nation. Iraq was one of the most advanced nations in the, in the Middle East. Absolutely, yeah. In terms They're of very the health system, so. education system, women's rights, and in all other spheres. And in e it's a <coughs> well-developed, economically progressive country. Right. We should keep that in mind. Yes. It's not some, you know, in 5,000 years of history, if I may say yes. so. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. But unfortunately, the sanctions that have led, I mean, mm -hmm. one could talk about the war as mm -hmm. an, an unfortunate event. Mm -hmm. But what really uh, uh, exceeds that in terms of impact, in terms of the, the tragic impacts on the, on the population is the uh, regime of the sanctions yes, right. that was imposed. And recently, the UNICEF issued a report uh, after uh, 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 months of investigation mm -hmm. saying that <coughs> the estimate shows that there, is, there is about 6,000 child under the age of five that die every month because of the uh, of the uh, of the sanctions can be tied to the sanctions yes yeah yeah and here you're talking about over like seventy thousand a year yeah so uh, there's much more of of price and this that is going on paying. for eight years now. for eight years now yeah. we are in the eighth right. year of the right. of the sanctions the worst sanctions is in the history of the world it's right? the I most mean, in comprehensive the it's yeah. more the most comprehensive is the most restrictive uh, sanctions that uh, that that prohibits uh, nothing from uh, leaving the country of commodities that we could sell to in order to get money. Mm. There was a, 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 a moderate regime of, of what is called the food oil for food mm -hmm. uh, program run by the United Nations, but it didn't really solve the problem. It's very cumbersome. Mm. There's lots of sophisticated and, and, and difficult processes that go on in the on the United Nations and trying to get approval for the contracts. Usually the United States and the UK uh, delegations give us hard time in mm -hmm. approving contracts. And there have been many delays uh, in, in, in getting food, medicine, and also in getting some other essentials, uh, things for our power plants yeah. uh, to, to maintain them, things for the sewer system, things yeah. for the oil industry to make it meet the capacity that's required right. for pumping. Uh, so unfortunately, this situation has not been resolved, and uh, we ended up uh, right now in another crisis with uh, the Clinton administration. As we talk now in November. More yeah. force and more military strikes, which again is not going to solve anything. Yeah. It will only make things worse in terms of the, of the uh, plight of the people, and I think also in terms of regional security. I don't think force helps security, mm -hmm. uh, especially in a very volatile region. We could talk a little bit about that. The, 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 the sanction. I wonder if the American people realize in a, in, a, in, a, in a can really feel the importance of that. You have a generation of people that you can see wasting away in a certain sense. I've seen figures that as many as uh, close to a million, maybe a million and over a half. A million, uh, over a million. Over a million. Passed because of the uh, impacts of, of the sanctions. And it's tied directly to the impacts of the sanctions. Yeah, malnutrition yeah. or lack of medical service, lack of medicine. You can't get spare parts for the water system, for yes, the sewage yeah, systems yeah, yeah. and these kind of things. Absolutely. And they can't, they don't do that in, in a. Everything has deteriorated. And it, it's all deteriorated and it's gotten worse. And that's got to be building upon to where, at a certain point, your patience is tried beyond a certain point when there are, from your perspective, if I may, I don't want to put words in your mouth, certainly, but in your way, that there are um, um, picky yoon kind of issues that are raised, that they're not, uh, that they're deliberately trying not to have the sanctions come to an end? Is that a perception that you... Yeah, that's the perception in, in that, that we... That, that they're deliberately dragging this yes. out? that the sanctions Your are, are not that. only targeting the government, they are targeting the whole nation of Iraq because yeah. the, the sanctions have an impact in every Iraqi house right. in terms of lack of medical treatment or lack of necessary uh, you know, calories for the kids to, to, to grow. Right. You're, you're not able to generate within... Iraq is a great and mighty nation. It's a huge nation. It's a very rich and rich nation. You're not able to generate by your own internal resources sufficient to meet the needs of your... Yeah, sure. This is that I mean. Could you could you discuss this a bit? Because there was damage of the wartime, and you are tied into the world economy again. It's not you're some, um, you know, independent small country or something of that sort. You're tied into the world economy. Yes, and these we, sanctions we, work yes. doubly different, difficult 
on a country that is uh, so well developed as Iraq is and has been. Right? Yeah, Iraq used to, to get more than 90% of its revenue out of selling its oil. Right. Okay. And we have some other commodities like sulfur, phosphates, and uh, uh, that we usually sell. Of course, there is the dates, which Iraq is number one in the world of yeah. producing. Uh, but the majority of our revenue used to come from oil. We were prevented since the, uh, uh, the, the, the Gulf War uh, or the sanctions that were imposed even before that. We were not allowed to sell not even a barrel mm. uh, to the outside world. So all of a sudden, all that revenue stopped mm -hmm. uh, up till like 1986, uh, where, we al where we allowed a very limited amount of oil to be sold under this UN package with for food or lots for of restrictions. Yeah. And, uh, so we were denied the source of, of, of revenue that help us to spend and help us to get imports that will uh, help maintain our systems it's in health or in other uh, uh, essential spheres. And these things, are dip uh, these things are crucial to the functioning of your system. I mean, spare parts and these oh, kinds absolutely. of things. You must have. You're absolutely. not autarkic or yes, something of that sort. Yeah, no. it's something to be understood. We try to improve our self-sufficiency in yeah, sure. some areas of uh, you know, agricultural products and so forth, but yeah. that's not enough. Mm -hmm. Without that, we could have been really been strangled to death. Yeah. But we were able to produce uh, uh, domestically many of the stuff that is required, at least for the basic food. Yeah. And then you have these things, and we hear here in the United States, we hear that, we hear that they're going to search uh, Iraq uh, for any weapons of mass destruction. This is the litany that we hear in the United States. I wonder if you could address that against the backdrop of these sanctions that have been so effectively delivered down upon the people of Iraq, uh, against that, uh, the, the, the arguments about trying to find weapons of mass destruction, the UNSCOM and, um, you know, and so forth, how how uh, you see that role of the UN and uh, and the searching for weapons, and they say that uh, w the information is not being forthcoming from Iraq. If they had full disclosure, this is the word that they will use, then the sanctions could end right away. But that you're being evasive in terms of not allowing the cer the UN um, you know the UN people to search for the last vestiges of some system of um, mass destruction, weapons of mass d destruction. How do you address that, or how do you see it? This well, is what we hear in yes, our media. Yeah. Well, there have been intensive efforts, I mean, during the last uh, over seven years since the work of the Special Commission started in Iraq. This is the first time that such uh, an operation takes place. It is unprecedented. It never happened okay. elsewhere. Is to try to, to disarm under Chapter 7, which is forcible, but of the United Nations, and to disarm with these type of very much investigative forensic means and so it wasn't easy from the beginning for Iraq to deal with I mean we had to kind of the, have to the error and trial and the, these kind of ways until we have reached to some understanding with them on what to do on the technicalities uh, uh, of, of the process we've been there have been ups and downs yes uh, on the on the modalities of what we consider sensitive to our sovereignty, mm -hmm. like the question of visiting presidential sites. Though, I mean, eventually we had to agree last February to open all those sites for them, and they went inside those sites and spent weeks, and they took samples of everything, of leaves, of soil, of uh, air, water. They found nothing in mm -hmm. it of mm -hmm. the alleged accusation. Those were those last presidential sites that they had held up? Yeah, all, the, all the presidential sites, I mean, uh, uh, that are in the country were surveyed first by the United Nations mm -hmm. team, uh, a team that was sent from here, and then inspected by the inspectors of different nationalities, including Americans. Yeah. And then uh, they took all the ki all kind of sampling. Uh, which has proven negative. There's no traces whatsoever of chemical, biological, or any other mm -hmm. uh, prohibited uh, items. Your position is that you have cooperated fully with the we UN We have cooperated to the extent uh, that we can, because yeah. we are talking yeah. about some documentation that was destroyed, <coughs> mm -hmm. either during the war or unilaterally by us in the first place. Which they're demanding? Which they're demanding. And you don't have. And we are telling them, look, if you are want to get those documents and things that are missing, we probably will be having the sanctions with us for the next century. Yes, right, because they, they, they can't be found. They can't be Perhaps found. Perhaps they didn't exist. 
or, well, they, I did, say or they were destroyed. Or is he, I mean, Iraq, yeah, they're, they're trying to say that you're being evasive, and you're Iraq, trying to say that Iraq they're, they're being unreasonable. Yes, I Iraq, despite its uh, advancement, as yeah. we talked before, yeah. but still a third world country. Okay. Not everything is that well organized and documented and things. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, if they think that for such a process that we have done, like the unilateral destruction of some of the weapons, yeah. that every bit of information was, was, uh, was written or was put in a computer, yeah. and Easily therefore Iraq will, Iraq will have to, to, to uh, reveal them, they are wrong. We yeah. told them that, look, we don't keep such track record of everything. Yes. Uh, and, and some instances, some of the officers were taking their own notes, jotting their notes mm. down. Uh, we provided that to them. Yeah. But there is nothing beyond on certain aspects of the weapons that were destroyed unilaterally by Iraq. Uh, but they insist, and not only that, they expanded the scope of the investigation. They, they did at, from the initial... Uh, from uh, the initial start of right. the, you know, the beginning, all what Iraq was required is to declare its programs mm -hmm. and for UNSCOM to uh, destroy, render harmless or remove, and then for UNSCOM to create a monitoring system, mm -hmm. the future monitoring system, the ongoing one, and then paragraph 22 will, will be implemented. Yes, this was huh? required. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because if uh, there is an effective monitoring system in place, this is the best insurance that nothing in the future would happen of producing, again, any of such weapons. Mm -hmm. That's the best guarantee and insurance for the future. Could, I wonder if we could back up a little bit and, and address just the psychology or the mentality of the people who address Iraq the way that they do now in this modern world. You're a modern, advanced country. Uh, there was uh, uh, a great deal of time when Iraq stood up to the Iranian threat, as it was seen by the West. There were ties, geopolitical ties and so forth. There was this um, mi the, the misunderstanding, miscalculation that was during the time of the Persian, you know, to the Arab Gulf, uh, invasion of uh, that's territory by American forces. Mm -hmm. But do they then see Iraq as being in a certain sense in a, in, a, uh, in a unique perspective in terms of the countries of the world? Or what do you think the United Nations or the United States behind the United Nations sees Iraq as being in a certain kind of a sense a unique entity or a unique political entity or a unique psychological entity that these sanctions and these searchings for weapons of mass destruction have to be so vociferous or so, so assiduously carried out when these weapons of mass destruction do exist in many other places around the world and the capability in producing them do. Do they have a certain kind of um, view of Iraq in your view that is perhaps um, irrational, geopolitically irrational in terms of looking at the country of Iraq, if you can understand what yeah, I'm saying? Probably this is the way they... How do you think they probably see they, it? They, they see it that way, but I think in my view it's more of... Uh, uh, of a question of their own creation of a myth that has well, that's perhaps been what I was trying to get at. Yeah. Back in 1990, a time yeah. when the U.S. was emerging as the sole superpower, yeah, and <coughs> the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yeah. So Iraq was picked as the enemy uh, for obvious reasons. First of all, they don't really think that Iraq is a threat to them. They do not. You I mean, there is no way that Iraq could have threatened the United States. That's an neither interesting... By, neither by intentions nor by any practicalities, you see. Or by the capability. But yeah. it's always good to try to demonize a country and demonize a leader and therefore to try to accomplish whatever images that are required by this or that wing, right wing, left wing of uh, certain uh, sectors in the American political spectrum mm -hmm. in order to capitalize on that uh, there could be some goals that relate to the Middle Eastern region by using the notion of Iraq being a threat mm. in order to stimulate uh, some lucrative business of military hardware yeah, okay. uh, which was sold to the different countries in the region. It would have been more difficult to, yeah. to sell mm -hmm. without portraying Iraq as the threat, as the, as the continuous threat threat to their security. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, otherwise, many countries would not have really wanted to spend all that money Absolutely. to buy that junk. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Uh, that's that's probably yeah. one of the... Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, on the question of free access to oil, I don't think that Iraq has uh, threatened the free access of the United States to the oil of, of the Gulf. Mm. On the contrary, Iraq's, uh, Iraq oil reserves are always being seen 
as a future security for the for the oil market mm -hmm. and Iraq was was uh, exporting to the United States around 700 uh, uh, thousand barrels a day by 1990 uh, mm -hmm. which is a significant amount and I Certainly think was, is, yeah. was also on the increase mm -hmm. so Iraq was willing to share in terms of supplying the West and supplying the United States with with its uh, need of oil mm -hmm. so why Iraq was chosen uh, uh, probably these are some of the factors but it looked like it's difficult for Washington to change its mind once they have picked on some something they get obsessed do you think it's an element of what they call scapegoating or a well, whipping boy an uh, Arab uh, whipping uh, yeah, boy maybe a whipping element boy, a whipping boy element, there's an anti-Arab anti-Islamic anti -Islamic sentiment in this country which is something that ought to be addressed well I cannot us, make my judgment yeah. on that or right. what I'm saying mm -hmm. that this is really a myth of their own creation mm -hmm. not necessarily this particular administration yeah. probably it was created before mm -hmm. but they carried on uh, on it and it, it probably fits the question of stereotyping somebody or some country or some leader in order to try to uh, to project uh, might yeah, they're, and they're, tr they're trying to say that you must be so that the, the, the weapons of mass destruction, bacteriological, chemical, or these other kinds of things can't be there, and yet just uh, a matter of some kilometers away, Israel, for yes, instance, you has atomic Israel weapons, and, and, of it, and the United States, we have this great capability of producing them all the time, these things are being produced, they're very, very threatening, they're very threatening to the human condition, I've talked with Ramsey Clark some about some of the difficulties that have been there, that, uh, so that it isn't the existence of these things in a sense, it's just that they have to be denied certain people who by certain criteria cannot have the weapons of uh, intimidation and strength and power that the people that have that power do have. Do, do you understand what I'm trying to get yes. at? I don't quite understand what the logic of it is apart from some, um, you know, mythic structure that's been set up by, uh, by the intelligence systems or something of that sort. Yeah, I mean, and, and the re same resolution which the U.S. presses on Iraq to implement, mm -hmm. which is 687, yeah. back in 1991, there is a paragraph that talks about creating a, a, a zone free of mass destruction weapons, yeah. of nuclear, and the same resolution, yeah. which is under Chapter 7, mm -hmm. which means it is mandatory. Nobody presses on Israel, for instance, under that paragraph, which is paragraph 14. They're right in the region. To try to also include Israel in some disarmament and some arms control right, you right. Know, aspects. The, the United States continues to threaten people with thermonuclear weapons. They've threatened Iraq, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in the 1990s with the use of potentially of tactical thermonuclear weapons. They use that force and power to intimidate lesser uh, yes. powerful yeah. people in the world. And it is that we want to maintain a world where some people have the power and other people will never have a situation where they're going to be able to in any kind of a way challenge the power that these superpower people do possess. And is it in their minds that there are certain people are constituted in such a way that they can have this power, other people cannot? Do we divide the world into people who are capable of do you, do you understand what I'm trying to get this at? This is what we call in the Middle East double standards. Double standards. Yeah, oh, that maybe when that it comes to Iraq, <laughs> the U.S. takes a certain, uh, you know, actions and criteria. When it comes to Israel, there is a different set of criteria. Yeah. Israel or others, you know. And others yeah, also. Yeah, right. Uh, depends and on how they see their... They seem to have targeted Iraq as something, you know, in some sort of a way, because the, it seems in a certain abstract, in a, in a certain uh, objective sense, that the things that they're asking for become to be, as you put it, um, you know, uh, th they found nothing. There was nothing found there, and yet they keep looking for something else and something else. And there's a piece of dust over here. There's something over here. There's something over here. And that process of trying to find things could go on forever in order to keep sanctions against the country for other purposes. Do you think there's an ulterior purpose behind yeah, it? Yeah, the United know, States. It reminds me some of, of some of the trivial uh, things that that Unscom, mm -hmm. Mr. Butler, people, mm -hmm. teams focus on mm -hmm. in trying to. <coughs> keep all the files open and to widen the scope and to procrastinate. When they discuss, for instance, some tests that were made back in 1980s, in the 80s, on the, uh, on uh, some biological stuff, and that uh, some donkeys were on board, they asked about the size of the donkey, they asked the investigate those officers and so forth, what was the color of the donkey? Mm -hmm. 
uh, which direction was it standing yes. when you brought it in the car? Yes. Uh, what kind of a saddle? Mm -hmm. uh, what did you use to feed them with? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. things that are really, nobody could really yes. recollect right, 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 back right, from right, the 80s. Right, right. Or whether we discuss the uh, unilateral destruction of some of the missiles mm -hmm. in 1991. They ask about uh, what type of trucks that carry those uh, uh, to the digs. And what was the color? Did you have any flat tires? What was the direction when the truck was stopped? Uh, what was <coughs> the wind at time of destruction? Mm -hmm. And things that nobody could really uh, uh, answer. Yeah. And if they attempt to answer something from the top of their head, uh, and it didn't, doesn't match some other stuff from the other guys, they are accused of lying, they uh -huh. are accused of, uh, of doing things under instructions by the government to try to deceive UNESCO. Mm -hmm. Things of that nature are th probably thousands of cases really? yeah. uh, of that sort. And is so that trivial, yeah, 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 yeah. but they consider that as something major, something that has to be addressed. Otherwise, they cannot, if it's not addressed, they cannot report the closure of, of certain items. Yeah. And from your perspective, these trivial things are what they're talking about when they talk about full disclosure. Iraq should have full disclosure. Absolutely. You're, you're hiding some of these things. And really, from your perspective, oh, yes, this sir. is you and your colleagues feel that these things have been shown, the, 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 the mission has been made, has been met, I mean, in terms of the, the reality, and that they're just uh, prolonging this on the basis of meaningless triviality? Yeah, yeah on more well, or less. we base it more on the type of the political motivation behind it. Wow. I mean, Iraq believes that UNESCO was utilized mm -hmm. by the United States because of, you know, by, by the way of creation, the way it was created from the beginning, it was created under the pressure and dominance of the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, all the ways and means of work and also the type of people that were chosen for it, they fit some political ends rather than technical ends. Mm -hmm. And we had the case that has been recently uh, revealed to the public, I mean, the case of Scott Ritter. Yes. Mm -hmm. And as from his own words, I mean, from the recent article, The New Yorker, for instance, mm -hmm. he was uh, closely associated with uh, some factions of, of Israel, I mean, and the Israeli Mossad. Yeah. And in, in the way of trying to undermine the government in Baghdad, rather than to reach out to, to the facts, mm -hmm. you see. Uh, this really proves Iraq point of view that the work of UNESCO has not been totally technical, mm -hmm. professional. As it was supposed objective, to be. As it was, as supposed, it was to supposed to be. To be yeah. As an international it's agency. politicized. Huh? Look, I mean, mm -hmm. like today's decision. Mm -hmm. Mr. Butler took a decision. This is November 11 today. Yes. Yes, right today. To remove the uh, inspectors from Iraq. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here we yesterday, go again. Huh? Only the day before, mm -hmm. yesterday, he was telling in a, in a show uh, that he does not intend to remove them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happened that today, or probably last night, mm -hmm. Mr. Peter Berlin, the American ambassador here, called him and advised him or asked him to remove those ins inspectors outside of Iraq, mm -hmm. probably because of, of the imminent military strike. You feel that this is, there is a possibility of, of course, an imminent military of course. strike? Okay. And he did that right away, without notifying the council. Mm -hmm. And he's supposed to report to the Security Council, mm -hmm. and to take any p such permissions from the Security Council, mm -hmm. or to the Secretary General, at least, mm -hmm. who has appointed him. But he did not do that. He right away removed them. and. They left the country, and then he will be briefing the Security Council later today. Mm -hmm. uh, so this also proves that it's a kind of a situation where he, he gets his instructions from, from Washington. Yes, right. As in last uh, February, February, remember yeah. what, what uh, Scott Ritter was saying, mm -hmm. and other reports in the, in the, in the American press mm -hmm. that the Secretary of State was calling Butler to try to reschedule some of the inspections. Do this now, don't do this now. Uh, which proves our point that, that this entity is well connected to the United States administration. Mm -hmm. And therefore, because of the policy that this administration uh, maintains on Iraq, which is a hostile one, trying to topple the government, trying to assassinate. That's right. They've said that all along, haven't they? That's yeah, on record, right. I mean, yeah, right. their own That's policy. Yeah. Therefore, the work of UNESCO will have also to be politically motivated 
in a hostile way to Iraq, you see. And this has been, and, and meanwhile, the sanctions go on, and the suffering goes and on. The and the killing continues. It, uh, yeah, the killing goes A million, over a million children. Since the uh, yeah. We have film footage that was going to be shown of that kind of thing, and uh, it goes on. And uh, you've come to this point now, in November, where the, uh, the, 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 the path, the light of the tunnel, where the sanctions could end, where things could begin to get into a normal pattern, simply is something that you cannot see coming, and so you've taken a, a, a stance of saying that we really have to address the world community. Oh, yes. The world yeah. has to address these these sanctions and the it's implications the level, of them. Yeah. And they've just been going willy-nilly along and uh, not addressing them. They have to be addressed. And that's the position of you and your government? It is the level of frustration that have really led us uh, into this uh, latest uh, position to stop cooperation with UNESCO. And the sanctions, uh, Ramsey Clark, you know Ramsey Clark, has said that they, they are a form of warfare in a certain very real sense, and they're being used very cavalierly around the world, it would seem, by many people. And so the whole question ought to be addressed in a certain sense of sanctions uh, that are so easily called and so easily used by the United States, particularly. You think it's something that ought to be raised in the uh, halls of uh, international concern? And so well, it has been raised, I yeah. mean, right But I mean now. in, a new, in, a, in yes. a new kind of yes. way. Yeah, right now the majority of the member states and the General Assembly of the United Nations, uh, they oppose to the concept of economic sanctions. Yeah, 193 Nobody sees them as fair, Cuba, nobody sees them as a human. Yeah, right. Uh, and therefore, I think the U.S. position on this is becoming very unpopular uh, on, on the, the world concept of, of sanctions. Yes. Yeah, well, I think they had the vote on Cuba. I think it was a hundred and it was only two. There was Israel and the United yes. States voted in favor of the sanctions on Cuba. That's another example. But the Iraqi uh, is one that uh, I should think there would be a great deal of support within the General Assembly for the idea that these sanctions should be the, the question should be addressed and they should be the suffering that's going on is addressed. Even 60 Minutes brought it up. They yes, visited and saw the terrible suffering and said this should be addressed. And Madeleine Albright said that uh, apparently this is something that has to be. You know, it's, it's unfortunate these people are all dying, but it has to be. You know, she took that kind of a position, which is an unfortunate one. You think, and your people, and your colleagues feel that there is going to be an attack launched upon... Uh, well, there was. We, it was averted in February and so forth. All, and the, uh, all the indications now show that there will be a, uh, a military strike. Good uh, Lord. On top of all the suffering now, that's yes, there now. Uh -huh. they're, they haven't uh, greatly increased, the Eisenhower there, they haven't greatly increased the firepower, it would seem, from what has been there. In fact, it's come down from what it was in February and so forth. Do you think the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, ability is in place in the region for them to launch? What kind of an attack would you anticipate? What kind of a situation? Tomahawk? Missile attack? How much of an attack? What? I don't how know. Uh, is there is there is there uh, you know discussion among you of what to expect? <laughs> Are people preparing in Iraq for an attack? And well, uh, we're expecting a massive attack. I'm a massive they, they'll attack. They'll be trying to uh, uh, to make it uh, you know heavy and to show their might, so to speak. Uh, but again, I mean, if you're talking about uh, about uh, the, the number of people we are losing every day. Uh, in the, sanc with the, the sanctions, sanctions. Yeah. I don't think that the attack would be inflicting more damage than what the sanctions were this doing. This is the point that Ramsey Clark makes. Yes. The sanctions are an instrument of war. Yes. Yeah, right. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. yeah. So we're expecting that. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, military scenarios have been always envisaged by military people and by the uh, top people in government. And I'm sure, I mean, some preparation has taken place in Iraq. What I understand from the colleagues that have talked with them mm -hmm. in Baghdad today, that they are prepared to mm -hmm. the extent that they can, of course, I mean, to defend themselves. And they are expecting uh, an imminent attack uh, by the United States. Any guess as to uh, what dimension? It was a tremendous firepower directed against your, cover, your country. And I think they're probably in the using the 1990, cruise, uh, yeah. tomahawk missiles. Tomahawk and, missiles. Uh, and what? also planes, I mean, yeah. obviously, yeah. land-based uh, planes from bases in Kuwait and yeah, right. Bahrain, maybe. Yeah, and those uh, Tomahawk missiles are terrible. They can be terribly destructive. They rain down. Um, what if this happens, and this is over the next days or something, Mr. Clinton apparently still making his trip to Asia and so forth. I mean, it looks on the surface that things seem to be, you know, um, uh, quiet or no great buildup as there had been, you know, in the time of the Persian uh, incursion and that sort of, the Persian Gulf incursion, that sort of thing. But um, if there was uh, a, 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 a bombardment, a serious bombardment of your country, what do you think the reaction of, let's just say, the people in the region, 
uh, because it seems to me whatever the coalition was that was against Iraq that had been built seems to be not at all what it was at the time. And what do you think the reaction would be for the people in the region, the Arab, the Islamic, or let's say for that matter the, the broader um, world to a unilateral action that might be taken by the, uh, by the United States even with the cover of a, of a, of a UN kind of uh, force? I, mean, I just wonder what do you think the reaction might be to that? Well, I think such an, uh, an attack will be shaking the region mm -hmm. up. And uh, people do resent uh, not only use of military force, but the continuation of the sanctions. Mm -hmm. But with a military strike, I think probably uh, the, the resentment and the, 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 the opposition to it will be greater of what has been envisaged by the administration itself. Uh, Obviously, that will happen on the street level. Uh, for the governments, regimes, and the Arab world, I mean, everyone has his own uh, type of relations with Washington. Yes. They're all susceptible to pressures, yes. economic or otherwise. But I think on the street level, the uh, Arabs will show uh, support to Iraq. How would that be translated as an outcome? I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. And uh, Middle East is a very unpredictable region. Yes. And especially if you're talking the the uh, you know Arab countries <coughs> around us, uh, there is a, a great resentment uh, in the uh, uh, in the Arab world towards uh, the continuation of the killing of the Iraqi people, be it on the level of sanctions or level of military strike. Yeah, the military. So it's di very difficult to try to uh, to uh, to to figure out uh, you know the outcome or the the repercussions for such an attack. Mm -hmm. But in all aspects, I don't think it's really going to serve. Uh, stability and security. Hard to see how, because if, if they do, what would they target? What would they be targeting? I don't think they'd be achieving anything except to harm, further harm and damage the interest of the Iraqi people. Uh -huh. In February, there was, such a, there was a great deal of outcry. They went to Ohio, um, Madeleine Albright and Mr. Cohen and so forth, and there was a great outcry on the part of the American people. There was a, a backlash, as it was. It was very effective. Uh, what do you think the reaction might Mr. be? Uh, you're, you're well familiar with America. Yeah. You're here, you know. What do you think the reaction of the people within the this United States might be? Yeah, this Particularly, they, they bombed that thing in Sudan, and that was a mistake. That was a pharmaceutical plant. That was bad intelligence and so forth. Do you think there would be ramifications in terms of the, the political realities here in the United States and feeling as though they're just using that for some scapegoating wag the dog kind of thing or something? Well, I don't know about, I don't know how uh, the, the population here will be uh, reacting. It all depends on how things are presented to them. Yes. And if the whole thing is going to be presented to them like back in 1991. Uh, yeah. As a video game. Yes. Uh, on right. the television Smart screen. Smart bombs down a chimney, yeah. And nobody feels that there is blood yes. shed. And mm -hmm. there are people dying, kids dying, women crying. Uh, I think if they don't see that side of it, they probably consider the government's uh, policy on this as <coughs> right. Mm -hmm. But if the blood is shown yeah. and the suffering of the people uh, are shown, which I expect because uh, right now there are, I don't know, probably hundreds of reporters and cameramen in Baghdad. So yeah. there would be good coverage of the damage mm -hmm. that will be inflicted. And I expect that to really help to uh, clarify the, the picture for the American people mm -hmm. and to make them realize the, the the scale of damage that was done to the Iraqi people mm -hmm. and not consider it as just like another video game. Do you think they'll be able to appreciate the, the, the import and the meaning and the depth and the, 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 of, of, of the sanctions themselves? Do you think they understand that well enough here in the United States? Or is no, it it's difficult. Taken you know, and it's they say, well, it's just, um, you know, uh, one of the prices of having lost a war, and That's if Saddam difficult. Hussein wanted to feed them, he could, and that they'd make these arguments and rationales, and they don't see it. Do you think they don't appreciate it adequately, or you know? I don't think they do appreciate yeah. it adequately. Not I only in Iraq, but on a world scale. It's a very difficult yeah. question of sanctions because they are silent. Yes, it's the killing silent is silent. Death, yeah, children, uh, children. Yeah. So many of them are little children. You yeah. don't see it striking at the television uh, screen mm. as if you know, what the bombing does. Yes. and tuberculosis. And so it wasn't diarrhea. easy for people to get to comprehend with, with the sanctions as a killing mechanism and also to try to, 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 uh, to uh, figure out who is responsible for it. Right. Uh, 
Some people blame the government of Iraq, but without understanding that the government of Iraq has nothing to do with the continuation of the work of UNESCOM, which is preventing the lifting of the sanctions. Uh, the, the U.S. Uh, depends on, on UNESCOM as a tool to try to justify mm -hmm. the continuation of the sanctions. Right. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a very trying thing. We went through, and it was, um, Kofi Annan came in February. <coughs> it, it was built up in February, you were aware. Then it came back. Uh, you don't see that maybe he could visit? There could be another visitation by somebody well, from the UN, something could happen? Or um, yeah. the idea of uh, another bombardment is a very, very unfortunate kind of thing to contemplate. And one wonders what it's going to serve, as you said. Yeah. yeah. Well, there is a possibility. I've been encouraging him to be more active on this. But it looks like the Americans are discouraging him uh, from taking any role in this. Anything similar to last February is not acceptable by the United States. Uh, and um, obviously, they have ways of putting pressure on, on him. But we still are hopeful that he could take a move uh, and, and go to Baghdad or meet the Iraqi president, trying to find a common ground. Do you find at the UN a good deal of support? What, what is your, uh, you know, if, uh, you, the, the people at the UN that you have contact with outside, let's say, of perhaps the United States? Or do you find that there's a good deal of support for and an empathy, uh, an understanding of the Iraqi situation? And what about now we have Mr. Primakov in Russia and that sort of thing? Has the, has the international situation changed at all to where there might be support for Iraq that uh, might have been a little hard to see in the past? Because it might be you know, a, a stronger, Iraq might be in a stronger position geopolitically or in terms of their contact with people in the world than some people might have assumed looking at through, looking at everything through the prism of American, uh, American, uh, you know, American sources of, of, of media. Well, the support for the lifting of the sanctions is growing. Yes. I worldwide, would and we could uh, feel it at the United Nations uh, corridors. But still, I mean, nobody has the, uh, the muscle that's required to try to overcome the American policy on the question of the sanctions, uh, both because of its uh, universal weight and also because of the veto power mm -hmm. of the Security Council. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't see that the international scene right now uh, change because of the Primakov taking over. Mm -hmm. I think the Russian policy continues on the same path. They have big interest with the United States that they have to take care of. At the same time, they still hold strong views on the question of the invalidity of the sanctions regime on Iraq and of the fact that Iraq should be given uh, uh, more chances to try to clarify its problems and to be given fair reviews of the Security Council which the U.S. have been opposing. Uh, have undercut? Have they undercut? The United States undercut? The United States have always opposed and undercut any possibility of uh, 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 an objective review. They uh, limited to the 60 days review, which has been stopped now uh, by a, a Security Council resolution introduced by the U.S. The 60 days reviews are very brief. Nothing transpires in it. Butler gives a statement, then everybody, okay, we'll leave it to the President of the Council to go and announce that there is no change in the sanctions regime. We have had 40 of them, 4-0 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. reviews since the end of the Gulf War. Mm -hmm. They produce nothing. Mm -hmm. The resolutions talk about not only the possibility of lifting the sanctions, but easing up the sanctions. Mm -hmm. Right. Nothing has been eased up, not even 1% of Hard, hard, hard. You see, hard, hard, hard. Yeah, hard, hard, hard. yeah right. Uh, We've said, I mean, everybody agrees that 80, 85, 90 percent of the work has been done. Mm -hmm. Mr. Clinton, on more than instance, came and said, well, the, the UNSCOM, UNSCOM people have achieved much more than the bombing achieved in getting rid of destruction weapons, by destruction. Mm. Okay, if that's the case, if UNSCOM has achieved like 70 or 80 percent, on that presumption, I will say, they have to lift the sanctions by 50 percent at least. Yeah, it would make sense. And also, for the, the remaining... He's up on certain issues, commercial flights, some exports, imports. Mm -hmm. 
so that Iraq could be given an incentive. Mm. But they have never thought of that, and never dared to think of making things more reasonable. Mm -hmm. Particularly if 15% of that remaining, a good deal of it is just trivia. Yeah. 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 If, the, if that is the case, and it could so be covered that by can be strung out as long as you want. And could yeah. be covered by the monitoring regime, you see. Yeah, right. The monitoring right. regime consists of monitors, devices, uh, sensors, all kind of, of monitoring of over 500 sites. Yeah. And those are the big industrial sites that have dual use yeah. capabilities. Right, yeah. that's the thing we, we haven't had to talk about. The, the, the idea of du dual use, if they take this dual <coughs> use to, to, if you're going to talk absurdities, they take dual use. If you have an aspirin, it might be converted into a bomb or something. They can take anything that has to do with an industrial, a new industrial system, or an industrial system, and say that it could be put to some military use and would right. render it impossible for any country to develop at all. Yes. Do you think they're doing that with Iraq? Using an irrational kind of use of this dual use kind of uh, assumption? Iraq particularly is being targeted as a, as a country and as an entity, as a civilization for some reason in a uniquely strong, hard, hard, hard way, do you think? At I mean, there is Libya, uh, there's other countries. I'll tell you, at one yes, point, yes, uh, we yes. wanted to import some pencils. <coughs> pencils? For education. For the children. For right? the children. Mm -hmm. And that was prevented at the uh, uh, Security Council uh, uh, Committee of 661, they call it, mm -hmm. who, the committee that oversees the approvals of contracts to Iraq, and they refused, the American representative refused that uh, On the basis contract of what? because there is lead. Lead, and it could yeah, be converted and to a bomb. Lead could be converted to some other chemical stuff. Could you imagine? Uh, it's hard to imagine, but it is the, the you know the alchemy of the, the the chemicals. Everything is related, and they can do it. And that kind of an argument could be an absurdist kind of argument that could be yes. used yeah. in order to to uh, to uh, you know to to mask it. What do you think the um, the end policy, the end game of the policy that the United States has toward your country is? Well, it looks like they want to change the government. Uh huh and also to weaken the whole entity of Iraq mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and, and the regional terms, you see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What will that achieve? I mean, <laughs> I don't really understand. I mean, mm -hmm. weakening Iraq, how would that serve stability of the region? Mm -hmm. I mean, given the type of regime we're still having in Iran, uh, I think a strong Iraq would be a good counterbalance in order to prevail stability and, and it was uh, seen that way even on the time. Iraq Iran level the more mm -hmm. Iraq is is kind of strong and able the more the relations could be normal you see I'm do you think there might be misdirection on the part of uh, the intelligence people I mean there was Mossadegh there was Allende there were other kinds of attempts and that sort of thing and now they've got bad intelligence in terms of this thing in Sudan apparently they destroyed a pharmaceutical plant with bad intelligence or what Maybe they just don't have good advising or good understanding in order to understand and that they may be not able to pursue what would be in their interest by having an appropriate relationship with Iraq, which would be in the American interest because of some overriding and perhaps, um, you know, myopic kind of view of the world that the people that are responsible for American policy have. Well, it's very difficult for me to speculate on that. Really. I just wonder how you might see things what from purpose, your perspective. All what we are seeing is that this is that very much damaging, not only to the interest of the Iraqi nation, but also to the future American-Arab relations, future and American, American interest Iraqi relations, in that and American interest at large, of course. I mean, you think yeah. once a reputation is tarnished of a, of a country, obviously its uh, interest and that specific region are not going to be served well if you are talking long term. Yes. You see here. Right. There and is a generation in Iraq that has been growing under this whole American aggressive policy. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, you could imagine the type of feeling that you are, uh, you know, uh, embodying in this whole generation. Or of yeah, 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 sure, because there's a great deal of opposition. And then, and, and also because it seems to be uh, against our interest on the, on the altar of what we had George Cannon. We had a sense of containment. We had a geopolitical sense of how we were going to set up the world. I wonder, do you think we have that, a sense of uh, what is the grounding principles of a foreign policy? And if it isn't grounded upon what would be our national interests, uh, uh, I saw Mr. Bush, even though he had been involved, and he had said that, um, that uh, we ought to, the United States ought to have much better relationships with the Arab peoples of this world than we do but uh, you know we have this tie with the Israeli, the, pa the Palestinian. In this, do you, do you think that uh, George Ball and others used to write about that? 
that uh, maybe we should be, re the United States should be rethinking their basic assumptions in terms of some geostrategic view of the world and that part of the world. They should be making peace with that part of the world rather than um, obfuscating the path that could lead to, a, to an appropriate kind of a peaceful relationship with the, with the Arab peoples. I think many, well, uh, it's a big question. Many you know? aspects uh, yeah. of the American policy in the Arab world will have to be readdressed. Mm -hmm. uh, because the conventional thinking in the Arab world is that America is becoming more pro-Israeli than what it used to be yeah. in the past. Uh, we expect America always to try to figure out Israel security, nobody yeah. has anything about it. Yeah. But they should not do that, the Americans should not do that on the expense of the Arab national interest. Or to do it at the expense of their own national interest. Yes, of course, Perhaps I mean, that's up to them to, to decide, yeah, obviously, right, obviously. Right. Yeah. But as for us, I mean, we'd like to see our interest to be understood by the United States and considered, including Iraq, the question of sanctions, that's part of it. Yes. That's part of the national interest of the Arabs and the Palestinians and probably others. Uh, Sudan, in this case, that really has been damaged yeah. by the American attack. Yeah, yeah. And misdirected intelligence. Oh, yes. Had, yeah. you know, well, I tell you, it's a, it's a sad thing that here on November 11, let's mark this again. We'll probably air this within a few days. Um, November 11, 1998, this drumbeat is beating up again. I'm sorry that in a certain sense, uh, it's being the, the people of Iraq having been submitted to the uh, sanctions are now being submitted to this increased uh, danger that's being directed at them. I'm sorry, I'm glad we were able to welcome you to the program to give Thank you. your perceptions of it, perhaps a little bit differently than uh, what people who the normal media perception of that part of the world might be. And we appreciate very much uh, your coming in. It's been a great pleasure talking with you. And I would say in the cable audience, it's been your pleasure to have the perceptions of, uh, of Nazar Hamdoun. He's the uh, Ambassador of Iraq at the United Nations now at this very crucial time. Happy to have been able to bring you um, his, you know, his perceptions. We on Conversations by Two will be coming back again next week. That's it for this particular program. Ambassador Hamdoun, thank you very, very much indeed for coming in. Thank you, Harold. Until next time. So I think uh, we'll probably try and air this thing maybe in a 10 days, something like that. Yeah, I think so, yeah. We have you send me a copy. Of oh, I have, I have one, I think. If, if all's going well, you can just take it with you now. We're going to uh, correct the spelling of my eyes better than us, right? Yeah, now we got it right? Yeah, okay. That's correct, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Well, then you got a website so people can get it. Are you, are you, are you paying good attention to that website? Are you getting many hits on that? Is this Our it? website? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So people can come there to get some information. Uh, yeah, we're getting... Uh, Average, I think, about probably 250 a day. Really? That's pretty good, yeah. 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 But when there's a crisis, it, sort of it, it picks up, up right? It picks up more. Are you familiar with that? Are you keeping up with that technology? And You know, Mr. Kamal? Yeah, I work, I work on... Uh, with the informatics? Uh, that, yeah, uh, with the Kamal, uh, Ahmed Kamal uh, of Pakistan. Yeah, he's really involved in that. Very these, much. These new technologies. They're, they're developing, they're well developed. I mean, they're well developing that in, in Iraq, the, the use of the new technologies are you able very or limited, with the sanctions very limited, no. of course i mean again i mean lack of resources and yeah uh, but you certainly could if the sanctions were lifted you said we recognize that sanctions are a weapon of mass destruction deadlier even than war deadlier than even nuclear war that the sanctions against iraq have killed Ten beautiful human beings, innocent of any wrongs toward anyone, for every person that all of our military aggression against Iraq killed.